once again, I would like to thank our elders and begin by recognizing the traditional territory of the Mohawks of Kanawage and thank the Mohawk peoples for welcoming and hosting us here within their territory. Niagawa. Over the next few days, we're going to spend time looking at some of our oldest challenges through a slightly newer lens, the lens of human connection, or the lack thereof. In particular, I'm looking forward to the innovation of collaboration jams, where we do collaborative problem solving in real time that allows us all to benefit from each other's experience and insight and to go home with new ideas and renewed energy. But before we turn to the coming days and the progress we want to make in the future, I also see this as an opportunity to celebrate the progress we have made on our journey thus far. Two years ago, we came together in Toronto to share perspectives and stories and build understanding. We left resolved to build together a global movement on social connectedness. We committed to creating safe places for dialogue and providing a voice for those experiencing social isolation as the first step to building connectedness through new online resources and dedicated forums. Today, we have an important online forum at www.socialconnectedness.org. Since our last symposium in 2014, the site has attracted over 22,000 individual users from 119 countries, and we're very proud of that. Through the first half of 2016, these numbers continue to grow. In 2015, 60 new articles were published on the site connecting people across the globe. With social media, our conversation has built a solid base of thought leaders and community workers to engage and support one another. During our 2014 symposium, I remember very well our first tweets and hashtags and our excitement when 12 people followed our conversation. That's a whole dozen. <laughs> and we were, we were very excited. <laughs> but building on that, <laughs> through slowly connecting and bridging, we have grown this to over 3,500 active followers with over 2,000 tweets. And I know this will continue to deepen and grow as we gather here today. In 2014, we also committed to support and encourage academic involvement and the development of a solid research base. We vowed to link research to practice to advance outcomes supporting social connectedness. Today, we are joined by senior students here at McGill University, as Jessica mentioned, who are taking the first ever capstone seminar on the relationship of social connectedness to international development. This opportunity is building and linking amazing young scholars to our work and efforts in very exciting ways. With special lectures and guest speakers every week, we explore the very real impacts of social isolation, and we examine the strategies, power, and potential of individuals and groups to build community. As part of the McGill community, we also reach out to other universities and important bodies such as the Caribbean Development Bank, where I was privileged to be invited to give a keynote speech earlier this year, where it was also very, very warm. And most of all, in 2014, together we committed to support the development of a community of practice shaped by an understanding of social isolation and directly contributing to deepening social connectedness. Today, we have many, many examples to share right across the globe, and many of you are directly involved in these exciting new efforts. From Connected North, providing critical linkages between schools in the remote north, grounded in cultural reaffirmation to explore and build new possibilities. 
to the Sinergos Institute in Southern Africa in partnership with indigenous communities, building understanding of traditional models of care, family, and belonging to Special Olympics around the world with a rapidly expanding network of unified champion schools. And so important is the dialogue we have created with new partners here in Canada, tackling issues including reconciliation with Indigenous communities, disability rights, refugees, and the need to build sustainability and belonging in our growing urban environments. And of course, we also committed to ongoing participation and to reconvene in 2016. And here we are, my friends. Yeah. When we gathered for our inaugural symposium back in 2014, we were only beginning to introduce the concept of social isolation to the world. Thanks to that initial meeting, and our collective work over the last two years, we have created a real space for thoughtful conversations. Conversations about how we can work together to better explain, confront, advocate around, and ultimately overcome the problem of social isolation. As my students know, I love poetry and begin each class with a poem or a reading or, or some other form of creative artistic expression related to what we're going to discuss that day, but mostly it's poetry. So you won't be surprised that I am going to quote one right now. The poet and novelist Alice Walker wrote, and I quote, to acknowledge our ancestors means we are aware that we did not make ourselves that the line stretches all the way back, perhaps to God or to gods. We remember them because it is an easy thing to forget that we are not the first to fight, rebel, suffer, love, and die. The grace with which we embrace life in spite of the pain, the sorrow, is always a measure of what has gone before. When I read these beautiful words, I am struck by my place in the world. I feel both impossibly small and impossibly large, deeply humble and massively powerful. I am reminded that I am small in the grand scheme of the universe, in its history and its future. We are not the first. Others before us have confronted brokenness and isolation. So we suffer, rebel, fight, love, often with no knowledge of those who have come before us. We don't draw lessons from their failures or inspiration from their successes. They fought alone, and that solitude makes us all smaller. But from these words, we can also draw great courage because while we are small in the grand scheme of things, we are large in our ability to shape our own lives and the lives of others. But I think that Alice Walker's quote takes us to the heart of what teaching is supposed to do. We educate our students about what has come before them and at the same time empower them by demonstrating that they can shape their lives and the lives of others around them. Each of us cares deeply about overcoming social isolation. Part of why I love this gathering is because it gives us the opportunity to turn that personal passion into a shared passion and to turn a shared passion into a movement. We do this by sharing and inspiring others to engage, by educating, and motivating others to teach by listening and encouraging others to learn. This is what allows us to open minds and eyes and hearts. Because when we do, we realize that isolation, ironically, does not exist alone. 
It lives within our world's greatest challenges. The knowledge we have, whether from first-hand experience or fr from our work, is the foundational knowledge for this area of study. And that's why it's on us to call out social isolation as we know and see it. That's why it's on all of us to spread the message of connectedness. Second, each of us can, must be a teacher if we are truly to build social connectedness. We know that as human beings, we always have an innate desire for connection. But not all of our newest technologies actually help fulfill that oldest of needs. Yes, it's easier than ever to know of someone. But have we made it easier to actually know a person? To see a person for who they really are? Technology, like so much else, must be a tool. A tool that all of us teachers must use to call out just how serious social isolation is and acknowledge how devastating its effects can be. And so it is crucial for all of us to serve as teachers, everyone in this room. But at the same time, we must also be engaged students, every one of us. Which brings me to the third key. We have to listen to and learn from the communities with which we work. I say with because overcoming social isolation is always done with and not for. That's why there's such power in truth and reconciliation commissions we've seen around the globe. Because it is not simply one group saying, I am so sorry you've experienced this. Here, let me fix it. Rather, it is everyone saying, this is how what happened has impacted me, and this is the remedy that I need. Here in Canada, we have just concluded the first phase of such an initiative with Indigenous peoples through Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, known as the TRC. As Chief Commissioner, now Senator Murray Sinclair noted when he delivered the final report, and I quote, this has been a difficult, inspiring, and painful journey. The residential school experience is one of the darkest, most troubling chapters in our collective history. As difficult as this journey has been, the next part of moving towards reconciliation will be more difficult. At its heart, reconciliation must be about forming respect. Building social connectedness, as I have said before, is about recognition, reciprocity, and yes, respect. It also requires listening and learning across disciplines. And so when I set out to design a syllabus that gave students a broad sense of the many instances of social isolation, the result was an overview of the defining challenges of our time. Climate change, the refugee crisis, rapid unchecked urbanization, devastating prejudices like ableism and ageism, painful legacies of colonialism in Canada and Africa and elsewhere. I'm not the only one who has come to this realization. When the United Nations decided to put together a list of the defining challenges of our world and assembled a development agenda to tackle them, they developed 17 goals for the international community to achieve by 2030. These 17 goals include things like end poverty in all its forms everywhere, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, and the list continues. But when you look at them all together, you realize that they are in vertical categories. Poverty, energy, infrastructure, civil society, 
the challenges of social isolation cut across nearly everyone. When they say we will end poverty in all its forms, ensure safe and affordable housing, and guarantee all people equal rights to economic resources, no matter their gender or socioeconomic standing, they are saying we will change the global economy so that it doesn't divide us into groups of winners and losers. Or when they talk about building resilience among impoverished people, vulnerable to climate change, and adopting sustainable methods of food production, they are talking about the safety of every person on the planet in response to humanity's most pressing threat. You may notice that when they promise to end the AIDS epidemic and strengthen substance abuse treatment, they are promising to eradicate stigmas that make millions feel like they are less than. And when they state that we will guarantee all children, regardless of gender, ethnicity, or ability, will be able to get a free, equitable, quality education, and anyone who seeks out decent work will be able to find it. They are guaranteeing everyone the chance to make connections and to learn from each other about the world we share. When they proclaim that they will knock down the barriers to full participation in government and equal opportunity in policy and public life, they are proclaiming that all voices must be heard and accounted for in our policy making. I'm reminded here of a favorite quote from another poet, Rabindranath Tagore, who said, I was singing all alone in a corner and the melody caught your ear. And those words speak to me about my dream for the world, that we will all be able to catch the ear of someone who feels like they are sitting alone in a corner or at the bottom of a well. And that also sometimes that person will be us. So the other part of my dream is that someone will also be there for us when we're feeling in that place and to make sure that we don't feel that way anymore. So yes, they are proclaiming that all these voices must be heard from recognizing the need for greater access to transportation and information technology, to target, targeting an end to forced labor and human trafficking, to promoting peace through strong and inclusive institutions within and among nations. They're talking about responding to our most urgent problems by building cities that welcome everyone, communities that protect everyone, and economies that work for everyone. I think that all of this sums up to me the importance of creating a world that is characterized by connectedness. And it's no coincidence, social isolation is not only driven by the existential crises of our era, social, social isolation also drives them. Let's take the case of Syrian refugees. These are people traumatized by brutal war, forced to live in swelling refugee camps or struggling to live in a new culture with the knowledge that they will perhaps never return home. In my class, we've heard their voices and they tell us what we all know to be true. Their plight is worsened when so much of the rest of the world answers their pain with a shrug of the shoulder, a raised eyebrow, raised in suspicion, even a heart filled with hate. Isaac Newton is often quoted as saying, we build too many walls and not enough bridges. How true those words ring today. When we see people turning away from the work of building a global community, and we hear calls across the West for closing doors 
erecting dividers and building more walls, real and symbolic? Is it any wonder that the bonds of social connectedness fray and the darkness of social isolation descends? Social isolation is too often overlooked in discussions of the refugee crisis. Even more so is the fact that social isolation is at the core of the conflict driving it. There's a brilliant young Syrian architect named Marwa al-Sabuni who gave a TED talk this past summer. She argues that colonial planners divided a once bustling, harmonious, and diverse city of Homs along the lines of ethnicity and faith. The colonial planners didn't just divide blocks and streets, they splintered neighborhoods and fractured the city's sense of community. People no longer saw one another as neighbors. Instead, they saw them as other, as the other, creating the conditions for conflict. Our greatest challenges will be interdisciplinary, and that means our approach to social isolation must be interdisciplinary as well. In some ways, I think of us as windmills dotting the countryside. Alone, a windmill can light up a home. But when those windmills are connected to each other, connected to a grid, they can light up the world. So we need to connect ourselves in service of connecting others. The work ahead reminds me of an old story. There's a man who comes upon a construction site. It's a huge project, and the size of it sparks his curiosity. So the man goes to the first person he sees at the site, someone who is moving a large pane of glass. He asks this person, what are you doing? And he replies, I'm installing a window. He looks beyond the man working on the window and sees a woman hammering nails. So he approaches her and he asks, what are you doing? And she tells him, I'm framing a door. Another person walks by carrying plasterboard and the man asks, what are you doing? I'm putting up a wall, he says. He does this with everyone he encounters at the site. And then he sees a man quietly sweeping some debris in the background of this activity. He walks up to the man and he asks him what he's doing. And the man replies, I am building a cathedral. Whether you are personally impacting the life of just one person or one million. You are playing an essential part in our movement. No matter what you do to contribute, no matter how large or how small the task, you are building something much greater. You are building a cathedral of belonging for all of us. In this work, we all need to be the cathedral's bricklayers, and its architects. At a time when there seems to be so much darkness in this world, our everyday work can be difficult and at times discouraging. As bricklayers, we must persevere, but we can't do it unless we're driven by the vision of the cathedral, a vision of social isolation overcome and social connectedness deepened. We are each bricklayers and architects. We are each small and large. We are all connected. And this is my joy. Thank you.